you know, when a Russian called and told me, tell us a story about uh, what you found can sort of help change a situation, do something different. I was very lost and I've been very stubborn about not practicing. Um, and today I want to share a story which is very deeply personal. It's very deeply personal to my organization and to me. And uh, sometimes it, it, after 24 years, it is difficult to distinguish the two. Uh, this is a story actually about an organization that CRY is today 40 years old. Actually, it will be another couple of months. Uh, but it's, I think from the day I joined, there's never been, you talked about a year, there's never been a year that's been the same as the next. So in the, in the, in the late 90s, early 2000s, we decided that we wanted to go change our work from relief to rights. What did that mean? It essentially meant that we changed in our heads how we saw what children deserved. The move from saying we do this because they are poor little things and they need charity to saying this is their right and it has to be delivered by the state we are only facilitators and as we walked that journey you know something really interesting happened to us it was interesting now in retrospect at the time it was deeply painful uh, what happened was we said you know we are working for the most marginalized as we worked for the most marginalized biggest question that started coming up to us was who will be in our privileged do-gooder uh, space who will be to decide what they wanted and what they needed and in many ways uh, you know something happened that happens they tell me in counseling uh, transference so the the the, the transference of you know, the Dalit, the marginalized, the utterly deprived, how, who am I to stand on his behalf? So we, you know, the effect it had on us in a very practical way. And we are a bit of a mad organization. We always say that we sort of show us a cliff and we go hurtle ourselves off it. And then we we'll figure out, you know, we pick ourselves up and we we'll walk off. And what we essentially did was we said, uh, let's build strategy bottom up and as we started doing that you know what happened interestingly and this is the reason I'm sharing this story with you because I think all of you if you are setting out to do social impact work will meet these questions who am I how do I determine what is good and how can I get the voice of people and we did it so wrong what we did was we, we broke all boundaries and said, let's figure out a way in which to get everybody to talk. So we realized we spent so much of time and energy putting democratic processes into place and we went on and, and, and before we know it, we, we imploded. Because you know what we'd forgotten? As an organization, we were an organization. We had to have a structure. We had to work. And, and, and the worst part that happened was that at senior leadership, we started doubting ourselves and we stepped out of the center and said, anybody, sh somebody should fill it, someone who has the right. And in doing that, we completely imploded. So at that time, it was really to me, in my personal, because my personal life is, my professional life is my personal life as I'm sure it is for many of you. Uh, the real challenge was, what do you do? Because as an organization, the, the leadership disappeared and everybody else was told, you're a leader, you figure out the answer. And it created, you know, complete chaos. So, so what did I do? I think to me, um, I've been away for three years. Uh, I came back in and said, I was not CEO, but said, what do, we, what do we do? So we realized or I realized that the first thing to do was to find my reason for being here. And something that our founder said is what 
I can do, I must do. And I must say I waded into it saying, what I can do, I must do because I believe that the cause, that what we are seeking to do for children is too precious to let go because we made some silly mistakes. And what, what you had to find was your own belief in why you were doing this work. I leave out of the window the fact that you were not representative or, you know, second guess yourself to death. So to find the courage to step back in. And I realized that that's what the organization actually needed to begin healing. They needed somebody to step into the center and say, I'm telling you what the boundaries are. Let's figure out, these are our mission boundaries. This is what we do work for children. This is how we want to do it. And this is what we will not do. Because in taking away those boundaries, we have just allowed people to say, you see, as I'm sure all of you will face, right? The symptom is the child in labor. The reason we can go till patriarchy, till gender, till caste. And, and, and we can't fool ourselves that if I don't resolve caste, Nothing will happen to the child. But there is no trickle down. The child cannot be trickled down to. She has to be paid attention to separately. That's our boundary. So we really, we actually sat down, enlisted the board of trustees and sat down and rewrote what our mission was. What is it that we had kind of left out or assumed was a given. So I realized that day as a leader, there are no givens. You know, there is nothing that you must assume, oh, everybody understands this anyway. Of course, we know what our boundaries are. We don't actually sometimes. If we don't understand that that's a boundary, any method is acceptable. So the first thing to do was that. Actually, almost restating, reiterating, recommunicating. And I know it sounds stupid, you know, sometimes when you, you think to yourself, what did we do? We actually rewrote and reused language the language of actually being able to understand right and we made posters we put them all over the place so whenever you walk in you know who your values are who you stand for so it was as a leader it was about really saying i think first finding for me why i had to do this and it was very simple i got so much from cry i want to give back it's as simple as that. Therefore, helping everybody else to find that. And I think in that process, we, I, I was tested in terms of, do I really walk the talk on this story of, you know, every person has potential? You know, I, I always say I believe every person, every, every person has potential. But do we really believe it? We have boxes, we have... You know, this person has really, and this situation, the, democ the, the democracy situation, had created a lot of bad behavior. Because the way you structured it, you brought out the worst in people. So you really had to plumb back into that and say, if I believe in potential, I'm going to have to go out there and say to people, I know that it's the structure that created this behavior. I will not judge you. And we will take it from here. We will see how each one of us can live the values, can move on, can do new things. And the other uh, crazy thing we did was actually to create a set of, therefore flowing from the mission, simple imperatives, stuff like go out and listen to people. Stop just paying attention to your own navel. Go out, talk to the world, figure out what others are doing, bring it in, open the doors and windows of cry because that's one of the challenges of being an older organization and to me that is very hard and, and uh, there is so much surety that i have sometimes it's scary you know we know everything we've tried everything and that's it nobody else can teach us anything but that's not true there are new people look at the way the environment's changing so to actually find that courage to throw away or to put aside your own wisdom for a little bit and say others can have wisdom. A 25-year-old trying something new 
can have wisdom. Our founder was 25. And here we were so many years later saying, what? This child, how can he tell me? You know, but it was a child who started crying. So this whole thing of just put it aside. So I think to me that's been, it's, 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 it's the story of, you know, at that time I, I printed out this, uh, uh, I, I don't understand the Bible very well, so I, I don't know which part it comes from. But this whole thing of, you know, when you walk through the valley of death and so on and so forth, I printed it out and put it on my board, you know, and said, you know what, whatever happens, I have to keep believing in myself and I have to help heal. So I think it's a lot about, uh, uh, to me, just putting, doing this combination of allowing leaders to step back into their own space of belief of why they know and can help people lead in one direction. It's a huge, it, it, it was, it's unbelievable to me that we stop believing in it so much. But to actually start believing in that again and yet at the same time to not swing the pendulum so hard that you stop listening to your people. You know, and that's been the challenge. And as we sort of walked forward from that, looking at all the values that you just want to keep alive in yourself. So to me, I just keep coming back to those two values. If I have integrity, I want to walk with integrity. And if I believe in people, I better walk it. I cannot say, now you did this and therefore you're, you're out of it. And that is often like some of the hardest things to do. You know, and therefore, as an organization, the last thing we did really was put some very, uh, you know, people tell you, why do you invest into uh, personal transformation work? But I really believe that you have to, the people who do social impact work have to transform themselves first. We have to. We don't have a choice. We are not supposed to sit here and say, you know, I am perfect, you're imperfect, and I am going to solve it. If, believe me, if I don't solve my own problems, I will never be able to solve anyone else's. So, thank you. Am I done? <laughs> I just wanted to tell you, it was, I, I, I did second guess myself a lot on, you know, um, it's it's my story, yes, but it's also Christ's story to tell. So a lot of permission giving has happened before I came here. So thank you all of you. Thank you for listening.